I'm not a fan of do doing field studies, although I've got field studies next week and the week after in various different crops, row crops and then uh, some vineyards. We need field data to validate models. But I think we can also use field measurements to initialize models, and that's what I'm calling the hybrid approach here, where we make a measurement of what is still in the air. So we go downwind of the crop, and we don't want anything downwind of the crop. It's supposed to all go on the crop. So if we can profile what's happening vertically beyond the edge of the crop, two meters, five meters downwind, then input that into a model, and there's plenty of atmospheric dispersion models that will calculate where material goes based on wind atmospheric stability, temperature, relative humidity, etc., terrain, surface roughness, then I think we have a model that we can now use to assess drift reduction technologies as well as conventional technologies. So I would do away with the plates on the ground because the wind changes and you have to move them all, it changes again, you move them all again, and let's characterize vertically what's happening with the airborne spray. We can then tell a farmer, you know, 20% of your spray missed the crop. That's a good educational tool rather than talking just about spray drift. That's 20% wasted chemical in, in, in an extreme example. Hopefully it's far less than that. So we've been working with a company in Sunnyvale, California to develop a laser where we can make these measurements in the field. And we did some initial testing at UC Davis. Uh, this was a few months ago where we took this sprayer vertically through the spray to, me to measure the droplet size, the flux, and the droplet velocity profile of that drift cloud. That will then plug into a model like AgDisp to then predict the deposition. Now this worked very well, so we've ordered the probe, they're custom making it, um, and we've got tests next week with, with the initial practical field tests in potatoes. It's kind of late for potatoes, but we did find a late planted field. There are other ways of doing this. You can put strings on towers, but that only measures flux, that doesn't measure drop size then we have to go to a wind tunnel and measure the drop size, so we've got to disconnect. Did we do it the same in the wind tunnel as the field? Why not just measure it in the field? So this is an example of wind tunnel measurements on strings, and then we would use a laser in the wind tunnel, plug it into a model that's called WT-DISP. Each height, what's the spray flux, how much spray drift is there at each height, and what's the size spectrum? Information on wind speed and so on, and then it will calculate the spray drift profile. So a few other novel drift reduction technologies. Hedges are really important when you have barriers around fields. If you go to South Australia, most of the vineyards and a lot of the crops will have hedges around the field as windbreaks. They're also very good interceptors of spray drift. So a well-designed hedge that allows air to flow through rather than a solid hedge that forces the air over the top could be a very effective drift reduction technology. Again, the laser allows us to measure what doesn't get caught by the hedge so we can begin to map out and model what will happen when we have hedges or netting around fields. Reverse Venturi Chamber, that's a way of making an aircraft basically perform like a ground rig. So one of the reasons aerial drift is higher than ground if you don't do something to change it is the drops are smaller typically because of air shear. So we've got a very high airflow across the nozzle, it produces smaller drops. So an inventor, again, at UC Davis, we do a lot of work with the guys at UC Davis, um, came up with a reverse venturi where you would, rather than contracting the air to make it go faster, as we do in our wind tunnel, you would expand it to make it go slower. So you put the nozzle in the middle of the expanded section and you get a, basically a helicopter drop that's airspeed at a turbine aircraft flight speed. So you can get a much larger droplet size with an aircraft than you would get if you didn't use this. So that's a good DRT. Again, we need a special way of evaluating that ACTISP won't tell you what that does because it's non-conventional. Wingtip sails at the end of the aircraft wings will help diffuse the vortex during flight that will theoretically reduce drift by 50% from an aircraft. So that's the other key thing that's against the aircraft compared to the ground rigs, the fact they produce a wake. Drops get caught up in the wake and they drift further well. If we put these on the end of the tips, that gets rid of that. The other way is to have a shorter boom length. Drop booms, dropping the nozzle into the crop below the boom. Changing the amount of the tank mix that's non-volatile materials is another key one. Uh, certainly the APVMA, I think I've got a slide. Next one, and then the other key, I think that the best key of all is the narrow droplet size spectrum. So this is just showing the evaporation effects. This is one of APVMA's analysis, and you can see 
Near to the edge of the field, these are all pretty similar, but as we move further away, if we have more non-volatile material in the tank, anything other than water, typically, then we're turning off evaporation or we're reducing evaporation and we have significantly less drift at anywhere beyond, beyond a couple of hundred meters downwind of the spray. So the final example, then droplet size is the drift reduction technology. You probably can't read that. That's an awful slide, isn't it? I apologize. But the top curves on a log scale, again, are showing us the drift we would get for going coarser and coarser on our droplet size. So I've gone medium, the red line, through to coarse, through to very coarse, through to extremely coarse, which is huge drops, not good for efficacy for many products. What I then did is took a medium spray, which gives great efficacy for most products, and got rid of the fine end of that distribution. All nozzles produce a range of drop sizes. Some produce a narrower range than others. So I took a spinning disc example, where there's very few fines for that medium spray, and ended up with Agdisc Brown with a drift curve that is 10, 100, maybe 1,000 times lower than if we had some small drops. Extremely coarse sprays typically will have some small drops. So I reduced the relative span, the range of drop sizes, from 1.4 down to 0.7, and ended up with a medium spray that would give no buffer. So we need to hunt for the nozzles and the tank mixes that will give us that black line. To me, that's the best drift reduction technology of all. We can have our cake and eat it. We can have the efficacy without the drift. So in conclusion, I think the key to modeling for the future to make modeling accommodate technologies, which is the theme of this session, is to, or my, my paper, is to try and accommodate drift reduction technologies and conventional systems both in the same modeling framework. Make a measurement, plug that into the model, let the model that's had millions of dollars of work done already on it, then calculate where those droplets will deposit to then calculate with a regulator and no spray buffer zone, with an applicator, how he should optimize his spraying, etc. I put on there, we need more research. Well, we always need more research if you're a researcher. So, you know, we're, we're ticking off the boxes next week. We'll do a lot of the laser work and refine these things over the next few years. So, sorry I went over a couple of minutes, but thank you for the opportunity.